Okay, hello. My name is Andreas Testa. I am coming from the Karelia University of Applied Sciences in uh, Austria. Um, I want to talk with you a little bit. This is just an introduction because I have too less time for that. Only six, six academic hours. A little bit an introduction to uh, machine learning and deep, especially deep learning. Um, I want uh, to know what is your background? Um, is your background computer science? Or is your, uh, how good are you in statistics? How good you are you in Python programming? Can you give me a feedback? I think I can say that most of us are from the computer science faculty. Okay. Um, but I can't say for all, but I know some, like, I'm, I'm good in Python and I know some uh, you know, machine learning. And uh, just what, did, what did you do in machine learning already? Um, so we just passed the class on machine learning. We did like in the, uh, all of the like normal regressions, classifications, trees, and uh, boosting, and some neural networks. Okay. So, and for the other people, we are from data science majors. So mm -hmm. We are freshmen. No freshmen. Yeah, okay. We did Python a little bit, but machine learning we. No. Okay, it's it's not really necessary to program in Python. I will show you some files, and uh, hopefully they are working in my, my environment, because this is not always here. Uh, yeah. And um, I give, will give you an access to, uh, let's say, a Moodle account in uh, our university, where you can check the files, and uh, if you want, you can download them and then try to implement them run them by yourself. Okay, uh, the usual slides in the beginning is about uh, where I'm from. So I said I'm from the south of Austria and uh, this is the region where uh, I'm from. This is um, Carinthia, as you see. This is on the border to Italy and to uh, Slovenia. Um, it takes me 10-15 uh, minutes by car to drink a real Italian coffee <laughs> in an Italian coffee, coffee bar. So that's just only where we are located. We are a quite young university. Uh, next year we will celebrate our 25 years of uh, the foundation of our university. And now we have four departments. Of course, the most important is my department, engineering and IT, but we have also important departments in civil engineering, architecture, and management in, in health science and uh, social work. Um, in our university, uh, we have about 2,000, 2,500 students. But uh, this, you should put this in the relation also to the number of inhabitants of Carinthia, we have half a million of inhabitants. We have also other um, higher educational institutions. So for us, this is quite high. So um, we are running. We are running in uh, our. It's only in our department. Um, um, bachelor programs in German, information technologies. Uh, this is a new program which is based on elder programs and includes specializations in uh, medical IT, in uh, networks, in geo-information, and uh, new is multimedia. We are running a program in mechanical engineering. Systems engineering is, let's say, some uh, compilation of, on the one side, electronics, mechatronics, and also informatics, and industrial engineering and management. The master courses are mostly in English. Only the master course in lightweight construction is in German. Ah, sorry. And the, 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 the master course in industrial uh, management also. The reason that uh, this is in German, the industrial engineering and management course is for mostly for local students. And uh, the people from mechanical engineering said us that mechanical engineering was um, founded in Germany and every mechanical engineer should speak German, not English. Justification. But in, uh, I, I'm mostly teaching in uh, the courses of 
electrical energy mobility systems and in uh, systems design. Uh, so for us, uh, it's normal that we are teaching also in English. Uh, research, uh, also to, to speak about a little bit the research, the, the numbers here are a little bit old. Uh, we have already now a third party funding of 5 million uh, euros and we want, uh, we want to get to reach at 2021, 2022, 10 million. And <coughs> we are running a big um, lab infrastructure, uh, one or Ah, oh, sorry, this was here. He went out. Uh, some of your colleagues know our facilities, and um, let's say so. Our our research is of course applied research. So we're working with the funding from the local government. We are working with fundings from the uh, government, from the federal government in Austria. We are working with fundings from the European Union. So, for example. I'm here uh, based on the funding from the European Union and um, we are also working if we get the contract with the industries, some development. Okay, so that's all about the introduction. So let's start um, with, with deep learning, um, what, what I have uh, now. What I was thinking, what we are doing in our lessons is a little bit introduction to give an introduction to logistic regression, to uh, speak a little bit what is a swallow uh, neural network, how this is worked out and how this is working. And uh, we are going to deep neural networks and especially to, uh, especially to convolutional networks. TensorFlow and so on I will skip out because there is no time for that. So first of all, um, uh, to the discussion, what is machine learning? Of course, you can find a lot of, um, um, of definitions and interpretations in the modern literature. First of all, um, there is a hype now about uh, machine learning, but I should say machine learning is a very old this. It was founded in the 50s last century. So, and we have a lot of classical methods which are a little bit behind now, like you mentioned this already, logistic regression, uh, uh, linear regression, boosting, um, um, uh, decision trees, and so on and so on, um, support vector machines, and it seems so this is not, no, not anymore necessary. Of course, everything is done in, uh, in deep learning uh, with the use of uh, deep neural networks. But um, for you, for your understanding, you should understand that deep learning is just one of the directions of machine learning. And um, I like the definition from Tom Mitchell. Tom Mitchell says um, that uh, machine learning is focused on two questions. The first question is, how one can construct a computer system that's automatically improving through experience. So this is, means that you have not to re, uh, reprogram the, your computer program when you get new data. I saw an, uh, a NASA nice, um, NASA nice definition where uh, somebody said that uh, machine learning and machine learning we have the data and we are getting the rules. Of course, you also can have the rules and the data and that you're getting the decisions, the classification. Yes. So it's inverted. And the second question is, and this is more interesting also, what are the fundamental theoretical laws that govern the learning systems, regardless where they are coming from? Learning, because also uh, we have learning, of course, in, 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 in organizations, we have learning in humans, we have learning by computers, but we have also learning um, by, by uh, some animals. Animals are also learning. So what are the fundamental rules? And uh, you will, we will see that uh, some of these rules are also implemented, for example, in deep learning. 
Deep learning is using some of these rules, but uh, it is implemented this in, in the programming uh, and uh, environment. So, uh, this is also a definition from uh, uh, Tom Mitchell, who said, what is a deep learning? Deep learning means improving some measurement of performance P when executing some task T through some type of training experience. So, for example, if you have um, uh, if you have a spam or no spam, a non spam a filter, spam or ham, which you can do, of course, with uh, not only uh, deep learning. Uh, for example, a, a logistic regression is, is quite enough, enough for that. But nevertheless, you have the task to learn a function that maps into your mail and make a decision between spam and ham. And um, this is the task. You should uh, cho choose the metric. For, for example, the metric can be the accuracy. But um, it is not necessary only to take the accuracy. You can also take the recall or the sensibility. Because sometimes it's more important that you uh, classify uh, something as spam, even if it's not spam, uh, than uh, some ham, even if it's not ham. Because if you are, if you are uh, afraid about viruses, it's better not to have the virus on your computer, even if the mail is a good mail. So this, this are, is a different kind of metrics for, for, for which we also could use. And the training experience is we need a um, uh, collection of mails which are uh, already labeled. And this is one thing, one of the hardest things in machine learning is to get labeled mails. Uh, let's say to, to label data. And everybody is fighting for data. Uh, <coughs> this is, by the way, also one reason why if you have a look to uh, the, uh, okay. If you have a look to um, the literature, then in most of the modern literature you will find five or six names, three or five, four are from Google or from Facebook or for somewhere, and the other three or four, or that one or two are from a university. Why? Because they have the data. And we have also now a change uh, when in the uh, 19s or the theory years, most of the authors came from the US. Now most of the authors are coming from China. Because China is fighting up one of the first places in machine learning. So, but uh, coming back uh, to, 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 to start with, uh, with the question, what, what is in your network, how this can work. A very simple example which everybody who had already classes in, uh, computer, uh, in, in machine learning knows, this is about this famous example about house pricing, uh, uh, where we are using, we have the size of a house and the price, and you should fit, you should say, you say okay, I want, uh, I want a house of uh, this size, and then uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, the machine should predict your price. Yes, uh, we are using, for example, in that case, what I'm showing you here uh, is a so-called um, rectangle uh, um, uh, rectified linear unit um, activation function, which is zero until that point, and then it's a linear function. <coughs> So we are giving inside the neuron a size, then we have here some calculations, and you are getting out the predicted price. And this predicted price is the prediction, and of course, also you have data, you have data where you have a concrete size, and where you also know already the price. So these are the labeled data. You will see here I have my data. They are not direct, sorry. They are not directly. Uh, they are not directly fitting. They are not directly fitting to this uh, linear regression which I am using here. 
but nevertheless they are close. So, but the prediction will be somewhere here, or the prediction will be somewhere here. So I always have uh, some error, and um, it is good that we have errors. Otherwise, if you would not have an error, our model would be overfitting, and this means it would be fit only to the data which we are using for the training, but we could not generalize. So, errors are good in machine learning. It is not bad. This is very important to understand, because if you're coming from engineering, and you're making measurements, then of course you know, error, this is something bad. You should improve the error. In that case, we don't really want to. So this means um, we have some, we can of course improve our features. We can say we don't, we all not only want to give the, 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 the size, we also want to know the number of bedrooms, we want to know the zip code, because it's important where this house is located. We also want to know uh, the wealth of uh, the persons who want to buy this. And based on these features, then we make some calculations and add additional features like family size, walkability, school quality, and so on. So this you see, we have already here some hidden layer. We have some hidden layer in, in our network. And this is then calculated and we are getting a predicted cost. So this is a small, this is a small uh, network, neural network, which we can use for the prediction of a house price. So, and, uh, <coughs> As you see, if this is um, if this is um, introduced, so we are connecting. We have connections to every neuron of our of our network, and all these connections have weights. And what we are learning when we are speaking about learning in machine learning or in deep learning is we are learning these weights. Not we, the computer is learning these weights. So we have initialization of these weights and also of these weights. And based, based on some algorithms and uh, based of course on the uh, data which we have here because we have, this is in one of the data sets with, uh, as you see, four features. But we, let's say we have thousand data or hopefully 10,000 data or 1 million data, even better, in, uh, in, our, in our network, then we can uh, learn this, we can learn this, and uh, we, improve, uh, we improve all these weights which we have here, and we are multiplying, we are multiplying the weights with the value which we have on these channels. So this is the way how, uh, um, a network is, is learning. So, of course, as an input, you can not only home features, you can use as input um, advertisements, user information, images, audio, for example, we are working in audio, English language, Armenian language, German language, and also radar information, for example. The output could be a price, the output could be a, the click-ons on some advertisement, and the number, how a concrete user, how often, at which time he is clicking. The images, these are the pixels. The pixels in the images, these are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sorry, um, for, the, for the images we are using the pixels normally as, uh, as the features and as an output we are using an object. I don't know who of you is using uh, Google Photo. Okay. 
So, but you know what's happened when you upload your uh, photos to Google, then it's classified. And they have a big classifier behind. And when you then go to your photos and say seaside, you will get all your photos from the seaside. But this was is based on machine learning. And what you are doing is you are feeding this, uh, this algorithm with training examples for free. This is the reason why you are getting this service for free and without advertisement. Of course, it's much, much more expensive, much, much more expensive to, uh, to collect all these data. Always make me in, uh, let's say, in the, in, the, in the German philosophical literature of the 18th century, First, uh, you find already um, the description what is an automate. And one of these, let's say, you can say also this is a little bit a resist joke, but uh, there was always this, this, this picture that you have a machine and inside is sitting a little child or a little Chinese who is really doing the work. But this work now is much more expensive then use all the users, say, okay, we give you space for holding all your pictures, and but you're paying nothing for that, but you give us the pictures for free to train our algorithms. <coughs> we have um, text transcript. This is very important. The, um, uh, the computers now are more or less able to uh, uh, to transcript a uh, spoken text to a written text, and if you look to the uh, to the um, let's say quality, the uh, the quality is really good. Of course, um, the computer should be trained to your voice. This takes some time. Um, it takes about five minutes, and after that, you speak to the computer, and he is texting. This is already it's no problem. Um, also, the, the translation machines um, are now really good. And about, about um, un unmanned car uh, driving, I will not speak. So we see that uh, for, uh, for these kind of applications, for example, a shallow neural network is really good for photo tagging. Uh, a convolution network for speech recognition and um, machine translation. Um, normally, we are using recurrent uh, neural networks, and autonomous driving is just a combination of the various um, applications. Um, you never can say you never can say in advance for which application, which kind of neural networks are the best one. So it's a really experimental work. If you want to go really to, in this direction, you should dig very deep and then try different algorithms and say, OK, this one for that case is what may be the best. There is no theory which can predict for you which kind of algorithms you should use. And normally, uh, if you are an engineer or you're coming from economics or from business, you will use the help of some people from uh, computer science because they are the specialists for the algorithmic part. But nevertheless, you should understand it. So this is how a neural network, um, for example, sorry, can, can look like. We have the standard neural network. We are calling this also the fully connected neural network. We see the connections. Uh, every every node is connected. The problem of these uh, networks if, is the, if the number of the layers is increasing and the number of the units is increasing. You are getting a lot of these kind of connections. So this means you have a lot of parameters to train. Of course, we remember. Every of this connection has a weight, and we should train this weight. So and we are very, very soon by a number of one million parameters which we have to train. And this takes time. Or you need very, very fast computers. 
So for this reason, uh, for example, the uh, convolutional networks were developed, which are using something like a filtering. We will see this on Wednesday. And the filtering is used to reduce the number of, um, of the connections. On, and this means the number of the parameters which you should train. Nevertheless, you're getting really good results. So, and there are the different techniques. Um, okay, this, this I will uh, show later. And the recurrent network, these are networks where you have, where you have also units which can have a short time memory. Yeah, normally, the unit after that she is trained is forgetting the values, but sometimes you need some remembering, and for this, recurrent networks are used, and the normal architecture is looking like that. So, which kind of data we are using? We are using on the one side, especially in supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning means supervised because all the data are labeled. This means for all the data you have a label which tells you this is a dog, this is a horse, this is, uh, let's say, the sound of rain, this is the sound of the seaside or something like that. And uh, we have structured data like the data which I showed you for the example uh, for the house price application. In this case, we know really the first feature is the size. The second feature is the number of bedrooms. And last but not least, uh, the label is the price. In, uh, also, if you, if you remember, we had uh, the uh, uh, this example for advertisement, then for example the user age is very important because different age, uh, uh, people in different ages uh, are looking for different things. So this is one of the features and of course the uh, advertisement ID is very important and of course did we have a click or not? And maybe also the time of the click is also one of the features which we could use. In the case of audio and image, the data are unstructured because in, case, in the case of the image, we are using as data the pixels. And the pixel, uh, uh, one, one pixel doesn't have a special meaning. We cannot say this pixel is just for ice or this pixel is just for the tail because we don't know what is on the, on the picture. In the same way, if you have an audio signal, Normally, uh, we are using as the features the frequencies. Yeah, we have uh, a Fourier transfer, a discrete Fourier transfer. Who knows what that is? Everybody knows what is a discrete Fourier transfer? You make some transformation of the object from the time signal to a frequency, to the frequency space. And in the frequency space, you are looking which kind of frequencies are used uh, for this kind of for this concrete signal. So, <coughs> but again, we cannot say, we cannot say for what uh, some special frequency stands. This is impossible. Yeah, and this is the case why we say these are unstructured data. And we are using, we are using um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the neural networks for both kind of data for structured data and for unstructured data. But of course, with structured data, we can deal sometimes better than with unstructured data. So, about the question why we have a hype in deep learning. Um, if you open now, let's say, a newspaper, and the newspaper is writing something about uh, something about artificial intelligence, then of course you will find the buzzword, this is all deep learning. And uh, the word deep now is, is used uh, everywhere. We have deep states, and uh, we have a deep learning, and we have a deep economy, and we have, everything is deep now. Of course it sounds so nice. <coughs> the question is, uh, if I said that uh, machine learning is so old, why we uh, why deep learning has such a hype? 
The hype came around two, uh, 2012. Of course, the normal way how um, uh, machine learning is working is to arrange uh, competitions. There is one uh, on website which you can try. Tackle.com. And there are always competitions announced. And um, of course, there were announced also competitions uh, before. Uh, uh, there were announced competitions uh, before 2012. But in 2012, was announced the competition for image classification. And this was the first time when it could be shown that convolutional networks and architectures for convolution networks give much better results than, um, let's say, other, other um, architectures. And this was the first time when the Alexa structure was used. So this means with the amount of data, if you have a small amount of data, it will not say it doesn't matter if which kind or which kind of learning algorithm you are using, because this also depends on the application. application. But nevertheless, you will get into performance more or less, more or less the same, the same, uh, let's say, results. But if the amount of data is increasing, and I'm speaking now about data which are not in the area of gigabyte but of terabytes, or if we are speaking uh, about data which are coming from. Uh, uh, from the area of uh, IoT, then we are speaking about about zeta sites, uh, zeta bytes. So this is increasing and increasing. Then it could be shown that large for large neural networks, the uh, deep learning applications are working much better. This has to do on the one side with the algorithms. On the other side, this of course has to do also that the computational possibilities are now much better than 10 or 15 years ago. And um, I will show you that even on, I'm using, for the demonstration here, I'm using such a kind of notepad. But nevertheless, come on. It doesn't like me. Ah, no, it's only you. Don't touch a running system.
sorry for that. Um, yeah, we see with the amount of data on the one side and also, of course, um, with the possibilities of um, uh, computation performance, we have now such a big improvement so that um, we really can see that with the uh, with deep learning algorithms, we are getting now better results than with the other kind of algorithms. This is one of the reasons. But uh, this can change. This can change in the future. We will have we will find other algorithms, and then of course the deep learning hype is behind, and we are we are speaking about something else. But uh, nevertheless, uh, so that uh, this is this is one of the reasons for my lessons also to give a little an insight that you are speaking if you are speaking about deep learning or uh, reading something about deep learning that you also understand what the, what the author is writing about or what the author didn't understand. Of course, mostly uh, what I see in the at least in the, um, in the newspapers and the journals. The, the authors don't understand what they are speaking about. So, the problem, as you see, is with the scaling. We have the data which are scaled up, we have the computations, and of course also the algorithms. And in the algorithms, this is um, um, one of the, the things which really improved the performance of the algorithms was a switch from one activation function to the other activation function. Uh, we will see what is a sigmoid function uh, for uh, logistic regression. And with the switch to the nonlinear relu function as an activation function, we have really, really improved results. So this is. Um, these are the factors, these are the factors for the scale. And uh, you also should uh, understand that uh, deep learning is mostly now an experimental work. So as I said, I can give you some hints how you can work, but nevertheless, if you really want to apply it, it takes a lot of time so that your algorithm is run. But you find a lot of code in the internet, sorry, uh, a lot of code in the internet to make your first start. Okay, so I said that I can uh, show you the place where you can find everything. Password. The password is uh, you see it here. Everyone. Yes, I wrote it in such a way that not not everybody is using it. Uh, 2019. So uh, then then you find uh, the materials and also some literature. You have it? Uh, sorry, could you spell the link the website because I can't see from here? Then you should move to this side. Sure <laughs> this I, <is> it. <laughs> I can okay, the only thing what I can do is uh, I can write it here. <laughs> HTTPS. Yeah. 
Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. was the introduction part. Now let's go to uh, more mass. Um, I will show you just as an introduction how we can use uh, logistic regression, logistic regression for classification. And based on that, uh, at the end, I would like to show some example in Python and in the second lesson that I will today at two o'clock. Uh, hopefully, I have enough time. I will, I will introduce, I would like to introduce the uh, shallow network. But why logistic regression? Uh, regression? Uh, first, not start directly with the uh, um, uh, with um, networks. The reason is um, very easy. Let's say the calculation figure which we are using in, uh, in neural networks is based on logistic regression. So if you understand the logistic regression, then it is easier to follow what I will say uh, um, in uh, uh, my lesson about um, the swallow networks. So what we want to classify is pictures. A 64 by 64 picture, and we want to classify it in cats or non-cats. Why cats? Cats are not personal. And you find a lot of pictures of cats in the internet. Just the type cats image and your computer will full of cats. I don't know why the people, but they like to, 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 upload, uh, to upload pictures of cats. So <coughs> what we are getting, what we are getting is a matrix of pixels, 64 by 64. And um, Every pixel has an RGB value between 0 and 255. And uh, we are using this for every pixel, for every pixel, this is we are using, we are using this description. So this is the reason, this is the reason. So we have at least uh, 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 12,288 features. And um, about the class, we will see how much classes we will use. So we, 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 in, in our case, we have only, and the label in our case is one and zero. One stands for cats, zero stands for non-cats. So, and <coughs> with nx, we will describe, we will describe um, the number of the number of uh, data which we have at the end. So, and every picture for every picture, you see, this is the first pixel, this is the second pixel, and so on. We are starting here and counting in this direction, but this is vectorized. So, this is in one uh, enrolled vector. So, and we can write this, of course. We can write this, of course, as a matrix X. Where I have here my first picture, and here I have my second picture, and then it depends how much pictures you have. Yes, how much data you have in your data set. This is the formal description of the picture. Uh, normally, normally a picture has RGB values because we have red, green, and blue. 
and they are in three different channels. But uh, in our case, in our case, for the first applications, we will not use every channel. So now we will use, we will um, transfer them to gray pictures and then use only the gray values. But this is just for, to, for simplification. It is not necessary. We can, of course, also make our classification of this kind of input. This is no problem. So for the notation, for the notation as you see where I have M training examples and every training example has my input with the features. As the features I said I will use the RGB values of, of, my, of my pictures and I have a label. Yes. I put this in that way, in that way in my matrix. So I have here the number of features and I have here the number of uh, training examples. So the shape, the shape, and this is already um, everybody who knows Python, uh, he recognizes already the, py the, the Python notation. Uh, and this is the shape of my pictures, NX by M. So, and the shape, uh, the shape of Y of um, the matrix for all the labels will be one. We have one raw, but M, uh, M, M columns of course, for every, uh, for every value here, we have a zero or a one. So, sorry. Coming to logistic regression. What means logistic regression? Uh, we have we have our input x. We have our input x. And we multiply this input x with the transformed vector of the weights w. And we add one value with the, which we are calling bias. So this is an input which we calculate for every, for every example, it means for every data set. I call this input set, and we put this in the so-called sigmoid function. The sigmoid function is looking like that. One divided by one plus e power by minus seven. As you have a look to the sigmoid function, I think uh, everybody who learned something in statistics um, say this is similar to the uh, um, density function, uh, density um, distribution function of the normal, uh, sorry, the cumulative uh, density function of the, of the normal distribution. This is also the reason. Uh, but we are using a function which is much simpler. Which is much simpler. It is looking a little bit uh, similar, but we are using a function which is much, much simpler. And if you plug in, if you plug in to this function, your value set, which you calculated here, that you, for very small, for very small, let's say negative, for negative, very, very a small set, you will get here a value which is very, very big. So the value of, um, of your ratio is going to zero. As smaller set is getting, the value of sigma of set is getting to zero. Otherwise, if the value of set is increasing and is positive, then this is going to zero, and the value of the ratio is going to one, and we have a saturation here, this is a limit, a saturation, if I would, I cannot write now, sorry. I have the saturation at one. Yes. So, <coughs> so this means for every input we get a value here or here on this function. And now we can decide and make a decision and say if the value is uh, of the sigma of x is less than 0 0.5, then the output is 0. 
And if the value of sigma 0.5 is less or equal to 0 0.5, then the output of sigma of x as a classification is 1. So that's the way how this is working. So, so this means we have we have our our weights. Sometimes the weight, if you go to the literature, are also uh, named like omega. And we are starting with omega zero because I can rewrite this here also as uh, a multiplication of let's say omega transposed. Let me call this x one. Why? Because if omega transpose if, uh, sorry, if omega transpose C omega zero to omega n, and I'm starting my vector here with B, x1, and then xn, then for omega zero, I'm using just one. And the output, if you multiply it, is the same like, uh, W transpose plus B because um, this year, this year are my W's. And this is this year. Omega zero. Because you find you find both notations, you find both notations in the literature. Uh, sometimes this is named in such a way. Sometimes, or quite often, especially in, uh, in neural net, in deep learning, this notation is more common. Of course, in this notation, you concretely see what are the parameters which are responsible for the variation, for the variance, and which parameter is responsible for the bias. And uh, variance and bias uh, are very important for the uh, for understanding uh, of the behavior of, uh, of a network. So the second thing what we need for a logistic regression, this is something what we are calling cost function. Why we need this? You understand we are getting we are getting some output. We are getting some output omega set. And this output is between zero and one. But our label, our label is only zero and one. So this means we have a difference. Um, we have a difference between the predicted value and the label. The question is always is this equal or non-equal? Of course I said here I can say okay I predict y in the following way. It is 0 if omega z is less than 0 0.5, and it is 1 if omega z is greater or equal to 0 0.5, based on the shape of the sigmoid function. So I'm getting a predicted label, and now I'm comparing the predicted label with the given label. If this is okay, then I have an arrow zero. But if this is not okay, if I have a difference, then I should calculate something like a loss function. And for the loss function, we are using a Bernoulli, um, a Bernoulli um, distribution. I will explain you why. As I said, we have an output. We have an output which is only zero, only or one. And if the output, if you take, let's say, um, a very, very um, famous experiment in statistics or in uh, the um, probability theory, is you have some box, and in the boxes are, let's say, red and black sphere balls. And you put your hand inside and take something else by chance. And you cannot really say, will this be a black or uh, will this be a red 
uh, ball which you have hold, but nevertheless, nevertheless, you ma can make a prediction. Can make a prediction. Okay? This will be red. You put in your hand, and it is black. Mm -hmm. Then we have a difference. But if you predict red and you hold red, then uh, the prediction is true. So, for the case. For the case that uh, the prediction does not uh, um, be equivalent, uh, is not equivalent to the label, we have some loss. And this loss, as I said, is based, uh, this loss is based on uh, a difference. And for this, we are, lo uh, we, are, we are estimating this. We are estimating this with um, um, maximum likelihood, likelihood estimation. I will not go deeper, but this is, this is the statistical background. And the Bernoulli, the Bernoulli, um, why this is not short? Well, one moment. something else on my computer what you see. This is the reason. Thank you. 
Ребят, ну ли functional is the following that we have um, the probability, the probability that I get an output x under the condition that I have uh, an output y, sorry, I get an output y under the condition of some x and of uh, sigma of x. Sigma of uh, this input is on the one side. This is a product. This is a product. How often you are running? You are running uh, your experiments of y powered by uh, well, let's say. times 1 minus y i so this means uh, you this is the output that you get on your experiment i and uh, this is was it black or red yes but you have a product and this product is not really good working so normally we are using a logarithm uh, of pi, and so you are getting a sum of uh, y i, uh, yeah, y i uh, log y i hat. This is the estimated result plus um, one minus y i of log one minus y i hat. So, and of course, this is always between uh, zero and one to get positive values. We are using a minus here. This is the reason for this formula, which which you see here. Yes. And this formula, this formula tells us when we are summing up about all experiments. We had, uh, we said we have, n, we have m experiments, so we are summing up between one and m. So why we are using a log function? The use of a log function has to do with the um, with the um, property of the log function that if the loss is if the loss is if y is one, if y is one, this will be zero. And then I want, if I have, if my expectation is large, then I want, want to have also large, large y's. This means, because the expected the, the prediction, the prediction is between zero and one. It means if this is close to one, then uh, my log function is going so, I will have some value some value which is close to here, yes? But I want to have a positive. This is the reason for a minus. And then, then this is increasing. Everything is increasing. And on the other side, if y equals zero, this means the, the label is zero, then I want to have, if the log of one minus uh, the prediction is large, then I want to have small predictions. And small predictions is 1 minus 0. If this is 0, this part is going to 0, this is staying, I'm getting 1 times minus this, and if the prediction, if y, if the prediction is very close, then again I get a big, a bigger value negative, and this is multiplied with 1, so I get a positive. So always I have, in that case, for the Bernoulli, uh, for Bernoulli I have the a positive loss function. And if I'm summing up, if I'm summing up, then I, over all losses, for every, for every experiment, or let's say for every data, then I'm getting the cost function. So this means for a given training set, and for a given set of, um, um, for a given set of, my uh, um, parameters 
and for a given set of biases, I get a concrete loss. And, uh, and also I get a concrete cost. And now my aim is to minimize the costs. Normally the cost, uh, the cost function are look, is looking like that. This is the surface for my cost function. And I, I'm starting here and I want to come to the minimum. Because if I have a minimum, if I may have a minimum, then I have a minimum of costs. This means I have a minimum of loss. And this means the prediction is as accurate as possible. This is the idea behind it. So the question is, of course, how to get from that point to that point. In the case of um, nonlinear function, we cannot use matrix multiplications. So, the, so we had to uh, uh, we had to use some numerical algorithms. There are a lot of numerical algorithms, but one of the uh, um, very often used numerical algorithms is the steepest descent. And what is the direction of the steepest descent on the surface? Sorry, I'm a mathematician, so I must. Ask. Okay. Negative gradient. Yeah. And, the and the opposite direction of the gradient. So we are taking, we are calculating the gradient of our cost function. So the question is what are the, what are the, um, the coordinates for our space? The coordinates for our space are now the weights. These are not the input data. But we are looking for a minimum of our cost functions over the weights. So this means if uh, I have here my my omega, and uh, I have here my bias. For example, let's 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 assume we have only one weight. Then this would be a true. Then I have a concrete a concrete um, um, pair of uh, of um, coordinates in the uh, uh, WB space where I can say, okay, for these concrete values, I have a minimum, and this means this, based on this minimum, now I can improve, I can improve my weights and also bias. And this is learned. We find the minimum, find some values, and based on this, we are improving the weights. And this was, is not only working, this is not only working for uh, the logistic regression, this is a similar way also used then, but of course for much, much more uh, parameters for the, uh, uh, for, for network. So what must we do? We must calculate. We must calculate the, the partial derivatives of J by W and by B, because this gives us the gradient and this gives us the direction where I find the steepest descent. Of course, this is not the only algorithm which can be applied. And if you go to the literature and check the literature, you will find a lot of other order, algorithms also which are proposed. But nevertheless, the steepest gradient descent is one of the most used uh, methods. Uh, another method another method is uh, called the uh, stochastic gradient descent. And this is, called, this is used for online learning. Online learning means uh, some set of data comes in, the algorithm is trained, and it, it is forget. For example, um, I don't know if, if this is also popular in uh, here, but we have an online, um, uh, an online uh, trading house, Zalando. 
it's something like Amazon. Oh. So it's an asset trademark, but it's uh, but something similar to, to, to Amazon. So they are looking what you are looking for, and they make you also an advertisement based on your on your uh, personal uh, preferences. And then you click, and they just use this one click to train the algorithm. And then it's forgotten. And this for every user and every second all over the world. And you can imagine how much computational effort for that, so for this you know it, of course, also what you, what you need to find all these data and to put this in the data war, warehouse. Nevertheless, nevertheless, um, uh, for the gradient descent, this means for finding the minimum, you are not using all data. Of course, this is impossible. You make just a stochastic choice. A sample, and for this sample is used for the train. And in the next time unit, another sample is used for the train. This is also an algorithm which is quite often used uh, for finding the minimum. Logistic regression. If you have uh, if you have uh, m parameters, is that as I said, we are using this this cost function. Um, let's call let's call the prediction a i. Let's call the prediction a i. And if we calculate now, if you calculate now the uh, the, 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 the partial derivatives. By uh, W i, of course we have m, we have m parameters. Yes. Uh, so um, sorry, it doesn't like me today. If I have calculated these parameters, then I can use the parameters to update my my uh, weights. And we are using for updating a, a hyperparameter which is called alpha, and this is the learning rates. It is something like a step size in a numerical algorithm. So this means how fast or how uh, let's say uh, how fast your your uh, algorithm is learning. The choose of the step size is not so easy because if you are choosing a very small step size, then your algorithm is learning very very slow. If you choose a too big step size in the beginning, your algorithm will not converge. It will run. It will run on the surface up and down. If this is your surface, then the algorithm will run up and down and will not converge if the step size is too big. So this means finding the right step size, finding the right learning algorithm, this is one of the big things, the things to run and to, um, um, to, to find, to find a, a good, a smooth running algorithm. Uh, how this could be done? Um, to find a good step, to find a good step size or find a good learning rate, you are starting with a learning rate, for example, with 0 0.1 or with 0 0.01, and then you um, increase this by three, always by three, and you will see 
how your, how your algorithm will behave. And then divide it by three. And also look for smaller step sizes. And then very empirically you find something which is fitting better. <coughs> uh, we all can calculate, we can calculate this, of course, we can calculate this based on, uh, on vectors. And this So, again, we can calculate our DPs. This is already the code which we can use in, uh, in, in Python. We can also calculate our, uh, our vector D, D, uh, W. This is the, uh, these are the learnings for the, uh, I mean the differences, the learnings for, the, uh, uh, for our parameters. And based on that, based on that, we are getting, we are getting uh, something uh, which is looking like that. You see, this is a simple, this is a simple matrix multiplication, matrix with a vector, and uh, based on that, we can arrange, we can arrange now our our learning because we say we say W. This is a vector. This is a vector. This is of course an, a number. Here we are getting the new weights also as a vector. So everything, everything can be implemented not like a loop, because as a loop this will take a lot of time, but it is better to implement it uh, than as a vector. So time for hopefully will work. So um, if you want to run, if you want to run your own algorithm, you can of course. Uh, sorry. It's crazy.
Okay. If you want to run um, an, an Python algorithm or a Python notebook, which I'm using here, normally you have to install an Anaconda environment. We don't have the time for Anaconda. And uh, also my Anaconda environment, when I uh, tried it yesterday, was not fulfilling all ever, every uh, um, let's say operation. So I'm using <coughs> an environment uh, from the from the internet uh, where I have a, a stored notebook. This computer, no, that is that's too much for you. Anaconda AM one is is not enough. You need a lot of packages, and then you have to try on these packages installed or not installed, and so on. So for this reason, it's better I use my environment. Um, but you cannot use it. Uh, of course, for this you had to do. Had to, first of all, you had to 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 to, uh, to make uh, to make this exercise and and pay to to Coursera for this exercise. But I can give you all the files because they are open. They are from GitHub, and um, you can try this in your own Anaconda environment. So. What we are doing now is uh, we want to try everything what we discussed now to implement. Um, this, uh, for this, um, I'm using a developed um, a Python notebook, which mm -hmm. is running in IPython. And first of all, what you see, we should install we should install uh, some packages. Can you read it? We need NumPy. We need uh, Matplotlib, and uh, then we need some some special packages just for pictures. Yes. I can now. I cannot try to increase it. Of course, otherwise I will lose. So we have everything installed. Now we will. Um, <coughs> I have a folder where I have all my uh, I have all my data. So I load the data set, and I split the data. I split the data in a training set and a test set. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you please zoom in the code? Sorry? Zoom in the code. If I zoom, I will release this, and I need this. Um. I can, okay, I can try. Better? Um, I'm splitting my data in a training set and a test set. Normally, the splitting is between 60% for training, 40% for, 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 uh, for testing, or 70% for training, uh, um, and 30% um, uh, for testing. The important, thing is, the important thing is that, of course, the training set you can use as much as you want. But the test set, for testing your algorithms, you can, choose, you can use only once. If you use the test set, if you use a test set, improve your uh, improve your algorithms, then again test it. Then we will have a problem because the result is already biased. Of course, you will get the result, from, for, but from a statistical point of view, this is not a good result because you have already a biased result. So this means before you are using the data set again you should change this by chance. You have to resample it. And let's check. Uh, yes. We choose just the picture. Um, I can, of course, change the index. Yeah. 
you see? Yes. And by the way, it was as a non-cat picture predicted. So the prediction is in that case true. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking not only, as you see, I'm taking not only uh, the training set, I also use the get labels. Because in the Y, in the Y, in this, in this set, I have the labels for the training set, and here I have the labels for the test set. So <coughs> now um, I should reshape. I should reshape uh, my training set and my test set because I told you this should be in a row. This should be all in one vector. So this is the reason why this, this uh, is, is, is used here. I'm taking from the original, the first shape parameter, and here the second shape parameter, just um, re reshape it. the test. This is just the test that I have reshaped it in, the, in a true way. You see, my number of trainings example are 209. This is really calculated. It's not uh, pre-calculated. The test, the, the test numbers are uh, 50. The uh, number of pixels per image is 64. And uh, this is the expected output. So the, the uh, <coughs> algorithm is working at that stage well. Now I have everything. I have everything in uh, in in one in one matrix. You see, this matrix has 12,288. You remember this number? This was 64 by 64, the number of pixels. <coughs> so uh, 2,000. Uh, 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 the, the number the rows, and we have 209. We have 209 data sets inside this matrix. And the same also for the other, for the other um, input. This is all preparation work which we should do to reshape, to reshape um, our input in such a way that it can be worked uh, then in the algorithms and that we can use the libraries. Dividing by 255 means I'm normalizing. Quite often, if you uh, you are getting you are getting numbers, uh, especially for some some operations which are above 255, but the RGB values are only from zero to 255. So the idea is to to divide by 255 and to to normalize it. <coughs> So now we are starting with the general algorithm. As I said, what we should do. First of all, we should multiply every input, every number with, with its um, weight. Then we should calculate this value, this value here, and we should calculate the sigma value. And based on the sigma value, we should make our prediction. Is this a cat or not? 
And the prediction is done in the following way, as you know already, if the output is above 0 0.5, it is predicted as 1, then it is cat. And if the output is below 0 0.5, it is non-cat. And for equal 0 0.5, it's up to you to make a choice. In, I mean, uh, to make a choice in, in your programming. Uh, you can use this for non-cat. You can use this for cat. This is <coughs> your idea. So, the first thing what we, uh, what we should start to do is to build a sigmoid function. As you see, in that case, I use for the sigmoid function already a numpy function. Why? Because for, uh, for this, uh, for in that case, the input the input will be a vector or a matrix. And if you use just only from mass the exponen uh, exponential function, it is just defined for one number. And you will get an error as an output. So this is a reason to use the NumPy library. As you see, it works. So the next thing is to initialize, to initialize our our weights, and to initialize also our our bias. In that case, I mean, in the case of the logistic regression, we can have initialization with zero. Because then later we, yeah, you had a question now. We, have a, we can have an initialization with zero. But in the case of the neural networks, this is impossible. We should use other initializations, especially in deep learning. And to find a good initialization for your weights and for the bias, this is the next problem. I, said, I spoke already about the learning rate. The initialization is also a problem. So if you have a look to the literature, you will find a lot of different, uh, different approaches which are proposed to initialize the weights and to initialize the bias. For example, what, you, what could be used also for the initialization is not zero, but uh, some, uh, um, some, no, uh, some number which we are choosing by, by chance from a, no, from a normal distribution or we can use uh, <coughs> also an equal distribution, but it should be numbers between 0 and 1. <coughs> so the next thing is what we need to implement is the forward and backward propagation. The forward propagation is what I showed you already when we are calculating the cost function. And we are going through all input data. And the backward propagation, then we should calculate all our partial derivatives and based on the partial derivatives make the improvements of our weights. So as you can see here, as you can see here, this is just plugged in, plugged in the, the cost function. And I'm not using a loop. I multiply this, I multiply <coughs> parameters, uh, sorry, matrices, uh, or I multiply um, um, vectors. Also for the sigmoid function, you see this is a dot product which I'm using here for the transpose. So this is all the, uh, the, the, the <coughs> calculations are done on vectors or on matrices. Of course, you can also calculate or program this as loops, but I'm not really recommend you.
So, here we have the output of our improved of the cost. We have the output for the, for the gradient and also for the parameters. So you see here uh, W, this is B, this is DW, DB. This is just on, on one. We have a learning rate. We have a learning rate uh, used here of 0, 0, 9. And this is the expected output. We are getting an output which um, is more or less the same. So we can start to make our predictions. And put everything together. You see, here we have the initialization. Here we are optimizing. We put everything together in a dictionary. And based on the values which we have for W and for B, we make our predictions for the test set and also for the train set. And then we will just only give an output to print this and um, to have a library, again, D. As you see, D is a library where we store the cost, the prediction test, the prediction train, WB, the learning rate, and the number of iterations. So if we go to this library, we always can check the data which we, which we have got. regression is, uh, is really quite fast and the test accuracy was 70 percent uh, the uh, accuracy um, for the train was for the train was about 80 80 percent hmm? uh, no, sorry uh, train 99 you see you see you see it is this is something like overfitting of course, if you have a training, uh, training accuracy which is around 100%, this means it is fitting just for this training set. And then you can expect, if you generalize it, you, I mean, generalize, uh, generalization means if you, if you apply it to other data, data, then the result will be much, much, much uh, worse. So how this can be improved? One of the methods for improvement, for example, would be a regularization, or we are using another algorithm. But regularization would be one, one of the improvements which we could use uh, for, this, for this function. But so And uh, here you see this was just a prediction which is wrong. Of course, it was predicted as a cat. I, I special choose one example where, where you can see this uh, is working. So, but and you see, pick, but the picture is not a cat. But it was predicted as a cat. So the algorithm didn't really uh, uh, image number five. What not was not well was not well classified. In the test set, of course. This is how the algorithm is behaving if we are using a learning rate of 0, 0, 5. If you choose the learning rate, the learning curve will change. Yeah, it, sometimes it happens that the learning curve is somewhere here. But when the learning curve is saturating, that this means it makes no sense to enlarge to enlarge the the set of, of training of training examples. But in that case, this is the number of uh, the number of iterations. We will not really get the improvement. You also can can play on the on on the size of the training set. 
or uh, you can play on the learning rate and then always check the learning curve. So, and this is one, one picture which I put it in, uh, the, uh, in, in, in the folder, and this was predicted. Well. But it's really hard to recognize a cat inside here. <laughs> but if you will, if you, for example, will put a picture of a, a, a dog which is something like a cat, it can happen that it is not really uh, not really good classified. So, okay, this is where I'm closing um, um, the lesson here. So in the next lesson we will see how this knowledge which we have gained here in logistic regression now can be used for neural networks. Because the, the idea for neural networks is in that case we had in that case, we have only that we have here our x1, xn, and this all is calculated here, uh, plus b, and then the sigmoid function is applied, and we get an output, and now we will apply this, we will apply this figure for every node. This means if you have a second node and a third node, then on every node, this always will be used. So we are getting much more, much more connections.